As many of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself in Christ, there is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. Jesus said, I give a new covenant that you love one another just as I have loved you, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. Let love be genuine, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. From near and far, let us worship God. Welcome to the 2021 Lenten Meditations with the community of St. Andrew's Church here in Toronto. Our theme this year is God So Loved the World. And it continues the same theme from 2020, when our series was cut short by the restrictions imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic. We have learned a great deal since that time about online presence and possibilities. And so we come to you this year in this YouTube format, and we invite you into Zoom conversations on each Thursday at noon in Lent. We welcome as our speakers, staff from the Life and Mission Agency of the Presbyterian Church in Canada, who each week will tell us a bit about their work and their perspective on how God's love is manifested in the world. In these difficult times, it is sometimes hard to recognize God's presence and God's love in the world. Yet the ongoing work of those who are at the Presbyterian Church's national office is one way we can see signs of hope and possibility, even in the midst of challenge. Today we welcome Kara Earhart, who is the Program Coordinator for Sexuality and Inclusion in the Life and Mission Agency, and she will provide the meditation. We also welcome the Reverend Anita Van Nest, the pastor of Stamford Presbyterian Church in Niagara Falls, who is a member of the Gender, Sexuality, Orientation, and Faith Advisory Committee. Anita will read scripture and lead us in prayer. The program on sexuality and inclusion provides resources for congregations and other groups in the church to be more welcoming and inclusive of all people, including those who identify as LGBTQI. Each week, our meditations have begun with a version of the Passion Chorale, played by our music director, Dan Bickel, on St. Andrew's magnificent Carl Wilhelm Tracker organ. We thank Dan for this beautiful music, which has delighted and inspired us. We trust that you will find today's service to be helpful and meaningful in these Lenten times.
God of life, we rejoice in your love, which has filled creation from the beginning and which calls all life into being. We praise you for Jesus Christ, who reveals most fully your loving purpose for all people. We bless you for your spirit, who draws all humanity into the circle of your tender love. Gracious God, bless us with your presence so that our worship and our lives may be a true celebration of your love in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Reading from Galatians chapter 3, starting at the 23rd verse. Now, before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian, for in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. In the passage we've just heard, Paul is addressing the church in Galatia at a time when they are engaged in a bitter argument. One of the problems they were facing was that as more Gentiles were coming to faith in Christ, questions arose about what they needed to do to become full members of the church. Did they have to take on marks of Jewish identity and be circumcised? Did they have to adhere to Jewish law before they could be considered Christians? Or should the law be set aside? What was really required to be part of the new covenant and the Christian community? Much of Paul's letter to the Galatians is an explanation of the relationship between law and faith, which comes to a head in our reading from today. Before the faith came, that is, faith in Christ, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. There are a few things going on here and throughout this letter. First, Paul is reminding the new members of the church in Galatia why they became Christians in the first place. It wasn't through works of the law that they came to believe. Rather, they came to believe because of God's gift of unmerited grace revealed in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. To Paul, faith in Christ is sufficient because the faith comes through Jesus' death and resurrection, this ultimate sign of God's grace and love for the world. When talking about the nature of God's love, there's probably no passage quoted more frequently than the theme for this series, in which members of St. Andrews will have heard preached just two Sundays ago. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. In the continuation of that reading from John chapter 3, there's a conversation that runs parallel to the one in Paul's letter to the Galatians. The passage establishes the sufficiency of faith in Jesus to be part of God's kingdom. The passage goes on to explain a process of judgment, which rather than being a one-time future coming of Christ is to be interpreted as a continual encounter between Christ and potential believers. It says, but those who do what is true come to the light, to Jesus, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. What this is talking about is an ongoing process through which God evaluates our actions in relation to being righteous or oppressive or sustaining or diminishing life. 
The second emphasis in our passage from Galatians is Paul evoking the words of the baptismal formula of the early church to remind them what they are called to do and how they are called to be with one another. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Through baptism, we enter this new covenant in the family of God not as perfect beings who are always right, but as part of Christ's body and ambassadors of Christ. Paul even describes himself as having died so that Jesus' spirit could inhabit his body. We are baptized into community so we can journey with each other, supporting each other to live more like Jesus and embodying God's grace in the world. When we are baptized, we are invited to no longer make meaning of the world through binaries or hierarchies, but to clothe ourselves in Christ and navigate the world as Jesus did through all of its complexities, power struggles, and disagreements. We are called to choose a different life. In some ways, the church now is very much like that early church. We are still asking questions about how wide and limitless God's grace really is, what Christian life looks like, and what roles are appropriate for what kinds of people. For nearly 40 years, these types of questions have brought the Presbyterian Church in Canada to where we are today as the church, trying to answer these two specific questions. Should the church bless or marry same-sex or same-gender couples? And should people who are in same-sex or same-gender marriages be ordained as ruling and teaching elders? The church continues to discern these questions, and so they're not the questions I'm going to focus on today. In the spirit of the season of Lent, I want us to return instead to reflection to what has been going on while these questions have been considered by the church. While our branch of the church has been talking about these questions, what have the experiences been of LGBTQI people? Have their experiences in our church been just? And how can the passage we read about baptism help guide the church as it thinks about these questions? After receiving several reports related to sexuality in 2017, General Assembly directed the moderator at the time, the Reverend Peter Bush, to write a letter of repentance to address the issues of homophobia and hypocrisy in the church. In the letter, Peter Bush writes, the church too often puts more emphasis on a person's sexual identity than on their identity in Christ. When the church ignores the gifts present within the body of Christ, it fails to appreciate all that God has for the church and fails to see God's glory revealed in all people. This excerpt of the moderator's letter is reminiscent of Paul's letter to the Galatian church. In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek there is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Now, this isn't to say that our identities don't matter. In fact, the identities we hold often impact how society interacts with us and are the basis for much discrimination and oppression. What this passage is saying is that to God, these identities should not be used to justify or set up or enforce social hierarchies. In God's world, what matters first and foremost is that we are God's children, all worthy of healing, wholeness, and abundant life. Too often, the church has been quick to treat LGBTQI people as a problem to be solved or as outsiders, rather than as members of God's family and Christ's siblings. When you hear the ways people talk about sexuality and gender in the Presbyterian church, 
It might be easy to assume that there are no lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or intersex people in our churches, something that simply isn't true. As LGBTQI folk are often talked about, whether as so-called unrepentant sinners, or on the other hand, as the solution to declining congregation sizes. It's that or we're swept under the rug, encouraged through other church members speaking in silence not to tell our truths. When the church assumes, as it has for so long, that the only people in our pews are straight and cisgender, we are erasing people. And in our failure to recognize people, we fail to offer care to our LGBTQI siblings as part of God's family. In the words of one report to General Assembly in 2017, such strong Christian endorsement of a broader culture which preferences heterosexuality as the assumed default standard has enforced silence, secrecy, and shame upon those who stand at the margins of what is normal. Despite the church's teachings to the contrary, the implied message received by our LGBTQ members is that there is no place for them in God's kingdom. This harms both their mental health and their relationship with God and the Christian community. Church is a place where everyone, including LGBTQI people, should be able to ask vulnerable questions and feel confident that our church community, our family, will journey with us as we seek answers. The level of care and support is part of a congregation's pledge at the baptism of all their members. And that kind of grace and care can be seen in groups like Saga here at St. Andrews, which is a space where LGBTQI people can gather for fellowship and mutual support. So as the church continues in discerning specific questions pertaining to LGBTQI people, marriage and ordination, I encourage us to continually remind ourselves of the grace that we are called to in baptism. For LGBTQI people, especially those who've experienced emotional, physical or spiritual trauma in the church, I don't hold an expectation that grace will or can come easy for them, especially not alone. For the wider church, that is why there is an emphasis in this work right now in listening, in part so that LGBTQI people do not have to carry their pain and trauma alone, but can share that load with the church. There is power in bearing witness and in taking that in, making sure that we don't freeze, deny, or deflect. This process of repentance for the pain the church has caused requires us to continually listen and to let that listening change us. It is a process of grace, one that we cannot engage in alone, but through community and through connection with God, seeking the wisdom of the Holy Spirit and a posture of grace through Christ. It is hard work, but it's holy work. Living faith reminds us that. Salvation means life, forgiveness, healing, wholeness. It comes from God's grace received through faith in Christ alone. This is God's desire for the church. May it be so among us. Let us pray. God of grace, your love is infinite and your mercy without end. Through the waters of baptism, you welcome us into a new life in Christ and into your church family. In this family, you call us to welcome, love, support, and care for one another, to nurture each other as we grow in Christ. We acknowledge we do not always show the care you call us to, whether in our families of origin or as a church family, Sometimes we fail you and one another and cause you and each other pain. We create divisions amongst ourselves and too often do not reflect your love for all your children. Though it is hard to hear, we are grateful for the courage of our LGBTQI siblings 
in telling their stories of pain experienced in the church. We pray for those who the church has failed to welcome or who have had their connection to the church broken because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. May new doors be open to them. We pray for those who have faced violence and abuse. May they experience healing and peace. We pray for those who have had to hide parts of themselves in order for their gifts to be recognized and for those whose gifts have been rejected. May their gifts be celebrated. For the pain we have caused both in our actions and in action, in our words and in our silence, we are sorry and we seek to go a new way. As we navigate these challenging waters of listening, discernment and repentance, help us to stay centered in your grace. God of justice, inspire us to seek and build your reign in the world where justice, love and peace will flourish. Let our thoughts reflect your wisdom, help us to speak graciously, and may we in every encounter be beacons of your everlasting love and compassion. Amen. We thank Kara and Anita for their participation in the service today. As Kara mentioned, the inclusion of those of us who identify as LGBTQI in the Presbyterian Church has been an ongoing conversation over decades and has been the source of much harm to those who have been maligned and excluded as if we are not part of the body of Christ. Kara's meditation today once again calls the Church to repent of the harm it has done and to once again overcome the binaries that have welcomed some and excluded others. Thank you, Kara, for the important work that you do day by day. And thank you, Anita, for being willing to serve and support through the advisory committee. If you would like to join a conversation with Kara and Anita at noon on Thursday about sexuality and inclusion, and our own engagement in building communities of love and inclusion, please be in touch with me by email at b.ferris at standrewstoronto.org, and I will send you the information for the Zoom meeting. We hope you've enjoyed all of these Lenten meditations. You're welcome to join the St. Andrew's community for a number of services during Holy Week and Easter. If you would like to join our Monday Thursday Zoom service, beginning at 6.30, please let me know. It's open to people of all ages. The Good Friday and Easter services will be posted on the St. Andrew's website at standrewstoronto.org. May you be blessed as we continue on the journey to the cross and to the hope of the resurrection. <laughs>